Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So happy and glad to have you joining us today. We're going to give everybody just a couple of seconds here, a couple of minutes to get joined in. And then we're going to get into the Word and hopefully finish this series that we've been doing on Go equals growth. Amen. Go equals growth. We want to know how to build a church, how to build a ministry. You got to go. You can't sit there and camp. You got to go. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to give everybody just a couple of minutes to get joined in here. And let me just say thank you to everyone who called yesterday and sent me messages for my birthday. I appreciate it very much. God blessed me, man. I tell you what, I got the stuff yesterday, boy. Let me tell you. Amen. I was excited with what, with, with what happened, but it's not about getting stuff. It's about just being here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, amen. Hallelujah. Hope everybody's got their Christmas shopping done. Um, you know, if you're going to spend any money on me, don't spend more than $500, of course. You know, I'm just kidding. Just being facetious. But I hope everybody is ready and got everything settled. You're going to have a great time with your families this year, this week coming up. Amen. Getting ready to launch into 2021, the year of the local church. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Let's turn in our Bibles to our three scriptures we, that we've been um, using for the last, last couple of weeks. And we're going to add some more scripture to it today because we're going to expand this a little bit. And we're going to unpack some things. And then we're going to tie it all together and bring this whole series home today. Amen. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. We're going to begin at verse 15. Okay, because we need to understand something. I want you to get this today, that you are prepared to go. You don't have to wait to go. You don't have to be wait to be told to go. The commandment has already been given to go. We're going to see that in just a couple of seconds. But I want you to know that you are prepared to go. You're not being prepared. You're not going to be prepared someday. You are prepared now. Watch this. Verse 15. Paul speaking. For as much as is in me. How do you know you're prepared? Because you've got something in you, okay? There is made, that God has made a deposit in you. You have something in you, okay? So what God has placed in you, you are, Paul says this, because I've got something in me, let me read it like this, because I have something in me, I am ready. Ready to do what? I am ready to preach the gospel to you. Come on, get that today. Paul has prepared you to preach the gospel. Why? Because you have something in you. God has made a deposit in your life. Come on, hear me today. He's made a deposit in your life, so therefore you are ready. You are prepared. That word ready means to be prepared. That word ready means to be equipped. That word ready means that I can go do this, all right? So you have been prepared to preach the gospel to them that are at Rome also, okay? And we could say it like this, to those who are at Covington, to those who are at Slidell, to those who are at Hammond, to those who are at where I work, I am prepared. I have a deposit in me and I am ready. I am prepared. I can go and I can do this, amen? Then Paul makes this statement. He says, I'm not ashamed. Of this gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's two things. Number one, it is the power of God, and it's the power of God unto salvation. Okay, so we have a demonstration of the power, and we have the deliverance of the gospel, the preparation of the gospel. He even says he's shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen? Okay. So let's put that together. So Paul says this, For as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to them that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's go to our other scripture, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew the 28th chapter. Amen. Matthew 28, I'm going to put my marker back there because I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Matthew, the 28th chapter, beginning at verse 19. 
at verse 19. Well, let's back up to verse 18, okay? And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Didn't say, not, he didn't say, te he, did, he didn't say this. He didn't say, teaching them to observe, observe all things that I have suggested to you. Come on. He didn't say, teaching them to observe all things I have given you an opinion of. But he said, Get, I have, teaching them all, to observe all things that I have commanded you. Okay, we need to understand the word of God is not an option to us. Okay, it's not an option. It is the commandment. We are compelled to do this. Paul said it like this. Woe be unto me if I do not preach this gospel. Amen. Teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Notice he doesn't send you out alone. He says he's always with you even into the end of the world. Amen. And then in our last, pat, our last golden text that we're going to use, Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat, at, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the words with signs following, amen, or so be it. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for the continuation of your grace on our life. We thank you that you haven't left us as orphans, but you have received us as sons and daughters. We thank you that you have engrafted us into the vine. Father, we thank you that our name was engraved on your hands, that when you look at your hands, you see me, you see us. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives, and we thank you that you have not left us abandoned, but you have equipped us to go forth and do the works of the kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's kind of unpack this a little bit today. And I want us to kind of zero in on the last passage of Scripture that we're going to come to in just a couple of minutes. But I want us to understand something. What is common in every passage of these Scriptures, in every Scripture that we've used, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Matthew chapter 28, and Mark 16, one word that is common there that is consistent is the word go. You have to go. You have to go forth. You can't sit back idly by and just sit on what God has placed in you. There is a commandment that you must go. Amen. Jesus equipped us for one purpose and one purpose only. Not that we would live a successful life. Not that we can have life more abundantly. But he equipped us to go. And as we go, these other things begin to happen. And God sets us up. Okay, he sets us up to go. That's the reason he, the Bible says he didn't take us out of this world, but he left us in this world to do what? To go, to be a witness, to be a standard of righteousness, to be the, like the city that is set on the hill, to be the light of the world. We are equipped for this. You need to get that today. I want to keep driving this point home. Because many times we, we, we're of the opinion, oh, I don't have anything to say. Or I really can't be a witness. Nobody's going to listen to what I got to do. Nobody's going to listen to what I have to say. If I try to lay hands on the sick, it's not going to work for me because I'm not the evangelist. I'm not the pastor. I'm not the teacher. It, 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 
I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not called to do this. We come up with all these excuses. And if you go back into the earlier teachings on this series, that's what Paul meant when he said that I am not ashamed of the gospel. Okay? When you begin to come up with excuses why you can't do something, that's a form of being ashamed of something. I want you to know this morning, I'm not concerned. I'm, I'm not concerned about whether I'm qualified. I'm not concerned about whether I'm equipped because the Bible tells me that I am qualified. The Bible tells me that I am equipped. He's given me gifts. He's given me abilities. He's given me a calling. Most of all, he's given me his word, which he said will never, ever fail. In fact, he guarantees his word so much that he says that he watches over his word to make sure it works. Amen? Come on. I want you to know this morning that you are equipped, you are ready, you are prepared, and you can go. Somebody say, go with me. Somebody say, I can go. Somebody say, I will go. Come on. Work with me here. Preach with me this morning. Come on. All right? But I want you to know something, that God sets up scenarios for you that if you don't go, he's going to make it to where you're going to have to go. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 8. The book of Acts, the 8th chapter. I want you to see something here. The book of Acts, the 8th chapter. You know, and as you turn there, let me just say something. Did you ever notice that the book of Acts never ends? It doesn't have an ending chapter? Okay, you know why it doesn't have an ending chapter? Because we are writing the final chapter of the book of Acts. Amen. The church is writing the final chapter of the book of Acts. Go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 8 and verse 1. Chapter 8 and verse 1. And as you're turning there, I want you to know that God is setting it up so that we will go. Amen. Watch this. Now, up until now, we need to understand something. The gospel had only been preached in Jerusalem. When Jesus told his disciples to go ye in all the world, he said, first go to Jerusalem, then go to Judea, then go to Samaria, and then go to the uttermost parts of the earth. But up until now, they, they never left Jerusalem. They're staying in Jerusalem and maybe on the outskirts, on the fringes of Jerusalem, but they never began to go out. Okay, Jerusalem is saturated with the gospel. Does that sound familiar sometime? The, the, the United States of America is saturated with the gospel. You can't talk to anybody, hardly at all, that can never say they've never heard something about Jesus. Amen? But watch what happens. God's not happy with just one place, one locale, one region knowing about this gospel. Because his plan was always, always, always for the gospel to go out into the entire world. Amen? And, we'll, we'll, and, and you'll, you'll see as you read the book of Acts that eventually the Bible says this, that they turn the world upside down with their doctrine. Why? Because something happened that caused everybody to scatter. Something happened that caused everybody to begin to move out of Jerusalem. Something happened that caused everyone, that caused the believers to go forth. And that thing is the P word that we don't like to talk about. It's persecution. Watch this in the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And, Paul, and Saul, who was later called Paul, was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against what? Against the ecclesia which was at Jerusalem, and they were all, say all, they were all, you're not going to be exempt from persecution. If you're not going to move out into the things of God, guess what's going to happen to you? Persecution is going to come, okay? And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, with the exception of the apostles. The apostles stayed at their home base in Jerusalem. Okay, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, of the ecclesia, entering into every house and hailing or capturing, tripping up 
men and women, committed and committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. <laughs> I wanted to throw that in there. He preached what? He preached Christ. Remember when you see the word Christ, it can mean one of three things. It can, it, Christ was not Jesus's last name. Okay, you've heard me talk about that ad nauseum. Christ was not his last name. He was Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed one. So when you see that word Christ in scripture, you need to understand, is it talking about the anointed, which is Christ? Is it talking about Jesus? Or is it talking about the anointing? Or is it talking about both? Amen. So they went everywhere. Jesus, Philip went to the city of Samaria and he preached the anointed and his anointing unto them. See, Philip went forth and he began to tell them about Jesus, but he told them about this Jesus that could set them free and deliver them and heal them and, 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 and release them from their captivity. So he preached the anointing and he preached about the anointed, okay? And that needs to be our message. We need to preach the anointed, and we need to preach the anointing. Let me tell you what I meant. In fact, we got time. Turn with me back to the, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, very quickly. Luke, chapter 4, very quickly. Have you ever, ever wondered what Jesus preached? Have you ever wondered what his message was? Jesus had one text. Okay, and he presented it in a bunch of different ways. He presented it with, 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 in, 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 in different ways each time he preached this message. This was the message. This is the message that Jesus preached, and this is the message that we need to preach. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You see, you're never going to do anything for, for God unless you finally decide you're anointed. Okay, you will never do anything for the Lord unless you get it into your mind and into your spirit that I am the anointed of God. See, you can't convince me that I'm, on, I'm not anointed. I, I, I won that battle a long time ago, okay? I know God's called me. I, if I didn't know God called me, I know God saved me, okay? You can't, I, there's no doubt there. So the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. He sent me to preach the recovering of sight to the blind. He sent me to set those that were at, at liberty, those that are bruised. And he sent me to speak and preach and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the message we preach, okay? The message that we preach is that God's not against you. He's against your sin, but he's not against you. He loves you and wants you to bring you into the kingdom, okay? And so when we don't go forth and we preach that message, God's going to make, God's going to give us divine setups to where we're going to go forth, okay? I want you to watch a couple of things here, all right? So Saul was consenting unto his death, talking of Stephen, and at that time there arose a great persecution against the ecclesia which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, with the exception of the apostles, okay? Now, let's talk about this for a second, okay? What is persecution? We've got to get an idea of what persecution is and get an idea of where persecution comes from, okay? And I'm going to rock your religious world this morning. We're going to kill a couple of sacred cows here, okay? And as I begin to do so, turn with me to the book of Mark and just kind of park yourself right there in the book of, in the gospel of Mark chapter four, because I want to show you something here this morning. Okay. And I'm going to give you a couple of statements to write down. And as you write these down, you can find this, the basis of what I'm saying in the gospel of Mark, the fourth chapter. Okay. And the reason I'm doing it like this is for the sake of time. If I, if I wanted to, if I fully broke this down, we'd be here till four o'clock this afternoon. And my wife would not like that. Amen. You probably would not like that. I'm pretty sure Facebook wouldn't like that. Amen. Oh, I wouldn't have a problem preaching all day. 
I don't have a problem with that, but for the sake of time, I want, to, I, I want you to get this and then come back to Mark chapter 4 and you'll see this. Okay, and I'm going to give you some scripture to kind of back this up. All right, let's talk about this persecution thing for a second because persecution is not what most of us think it is. Okay, number one, persecution is not sent by God. Okay, God doesn't persecute us. Persecution is a result of God working in and through you. Write that down. Persecution is not sent by God, but it is a result of God working in and working through you. Let me say that again so you get it. Persecution is not sent by God, but it is a consequence of God working through you and working in you. That's number one. Number two, persecution is not a result of your presumption and foolish choices. Persecution is not a result of your presumption and foolish choices. It is a result of your stance for your faith. It is a result of your stance for your faith. Some of us, we think when we, when, we, when we think we're being persecuted, you're not being persecuted. You're being persecuted because you didn't think things out before you began to do something. Okay? You didn't do something according to the word. And so, no, that's not persecution. That's self-inflicted wounds. And there are many of us as believers, due to lack of teaching, due to lack of prayer, due to lack of not staying in the word, we have self-injured ourselves. We have inflicted wounds upon ourselves as a result of our bad decisions, as a result of doing things that we're not supposed to do, as a result of our disobedience, okay? Number three, persecution is not meant to destroy you. Write that down. Persecution is not meant to destroy you. Persecution is meant to make you stronger. Persecution is meant to make you stronger. Write that down. Here's the big one, okay? Persecution is not your testimony. <laughs> Persecution is not your testimony. Your testimony is your victory in and through the persecution. Your testimony is victory in and through the persecution. Let me tell you something, okay? You will never win someone to the Lord by telling people how poor you are, okay? You're not going to win people to the Lord telling how people how sick you are. You're not going to win people to the Lord by telling people how bound up you are. But you will win people to the Lord when you begin to say, you know what? I was so poor once I couldn't pay attention. I couldn't rub two nickels together. But you know what? God brought me through all that and he has brought me to a place of blessing. He's brought me to a place of abundance. He's brought me to a place where not only are my needs met, but I'm able to help meet the needs of others. That's a testimony, okay? Persecution is not, oh, I got cancer and I just don't know what to do. No, that's, that's, that's not your testimony. But your testimony is God is carrying me through this battle with cancer. Come on, all right? All right, that's your testimony. The Bible says we overcame him, meaning Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony, okay? Now, I told you to turn to the book of Mark chapter four, all right? Turn with me there, Mark chapter four. In ver beginning at verse 12, the parable of the sower, okay? And you've heard me say this before. The par this, this particular chapter, and Jesus makes the statement, okay? Jesus makes the statement that if you understand this illustration, you will understand everything he says. So I call this an overlay chapter. What do I mean by that? I can take this chapter and I can take anything that Jesus has taught and I can lay this chapter over it and I can begin to see what he's going to say. That's a, that, that, that's a key to you, okay? That's a tidbit to you. That's lanyap to you when you're studying your Bible. If you got a passage of scripture that you don't understand, 
lay this chapter over it and read it in the light of Mark chapter four. Watch what Jesus says. And he said unto them, know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? Verse 13, going to verse 14, the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately. Didn't wait till, he doesn't wait till tomorrow. He doesn't wait till next week. He doesn't wait 10 or 15 minutes. The Bible says what? He comes now. He comes immediately. And he comes to do one thing. He comes to take away the word that was sown in your heart. A beautiful picture of this is in the book of Matthew chapter 3 going into Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says what? That the, the, the Lord spoke, the Holy Spirit came down and the Lord spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. And then immediately the Bible says in verse four, chapter 4 verse 1, Satan, Satan led Jesus into the wilderness. He came immediately to steal away the word that was sown in the heart of Jesus. My God, if he's going to try to steal the word out of Jesus' heart, what do you think he's going to do to you? Come on. All right. Immediately, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in your heart. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground. And who, when they have heard the word, they receive it with gladness and having no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Watch, watch, watch. When affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. Persecution always comes because of the word that you have heard. You need to write that down. You need to get that in the, in, in, into your spirit and into your mind, okay? The reason some of us go through what we go through is because we listen to too many preachers. Ah, come on, all right? Because when you hear that word, you are responsible for the word you hear. And watch this. You are responsible for the word that you hear and the enemy comes to take it away. So you see, when persecution comes, when attacks come, it's a good thing. Why? Because it means you're getting the word, okay? But watch this. When affliction or persecution arises, and, and I'm just going to say this in passing. I'm not going to teach on this today. But there's a difference between affliction and there's a difference between affliction and persecution. Two different things, okay? Immediately, they are offended. You see... You get offended when persecution comes. I'm going to show you that in the scripture in just a second, okay? Arises, when persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things enter in, choking the word, and it becometh unfruitful. I might as well finish this, to finish this story out. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Amen? Okay, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. So persecution always comes because of the word, all right? You're not being persecuted because the devil's mad at you. Stop being so self-centered and conceited, okay? The devil's not really concerned about you. All right. The persecution comes because of the word. OK, he does want to stop you and stop what is in you. He's not concerned about you. He's concerned about the word that is in you. And me, I'm going to say you are not a threat to the devil. OK, the word in you is a threat to the devil. And it's you releasing that word that wrecks havoc and damages his kingdom. Now, let me show you that from the scripture very quickly, and then we'll go, we'll go we'll go on with where we're going with this. Okay, all right. Turn with me to the book of Genesis, book of Genesis, chapter three, verses one through seven. In fact, I tell you what, just write that down. Don't bother turning there. Oh, I'll tell you what, let's turn it. Genesis chapter one, Genesis the first chapter. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter three, in verse one. Genesis chapter three, in verse one. Amen. We know the story, but let's just kind of look at something here. I want you to see something. Okay. 
Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, he said, he said, he said, okay? He said to the woman, yea, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Did the devil quote the word? Yes, he did. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of, eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, truth, neither shall you touch it, lie, lest you die. What happened? She didn't fight the enemy with the word. She fought the enemy. Oh, this is going to preach right here. This is going to hurt somebody. But I want you to get this. This is going to solve some of our problems right here. She responded with the word of God and with what she thought it meant. Pause for effect. She responded with the word of God and with what she thought it meant. She never took the time to really understand, and Adam never really took the time to teach her what God was really saying. Okay? That's, a, that's the first religious statement in the Bible, right there. Because you see, religion is what man thinks God is saying. Okay? Religion is what man thinks God is saying. So Eve got religious. All right? And watch this. But the fruit of the tree which is in the garden, in the, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and knowing evil. Okay, and then of course we know what happened, okay? And then when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was a tree to be desired, to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. See, this is the thing, okay? Adam sat right there and watched this whole thing. Adam sat right there and never stood up and never cast the serpent away, never rebuked him, never stopped the discussion. It's so it's, that's why the sin entered in through Adam. It didn't enter in through Eve, okay? It entered in through Adam. Adam's the one who released the curse into the earth. God didn't release a curse into the earth, my friend. Adam released it. He set things in motion for it to happen, okay? So what do we have here? We have someone who hears the word but doesn't respond properly with the word, okay? The persecution came when the enemy came, Okay, come on, watch this. The persecution came when the enemy came and said, has God not said you shall eat of every tree of the garden? He challenged the word. That's the persecution. And the reason that they could not defeat the persecution was because they didn't respond properly with the word of God. You see, if you study this out, you will find out that the same thing that brings the persecution, the word of God, is the same thing that will, that will defeat the persecution, which is the word of God. You can't go out here somewhere and find another tool to defeat the enemy. You have to use the word of God to defeat him. That's the only thing that's going to beat him. That's the only thing that's going to stop him. That's the only thing that you're going, that's going to cause you to win in the spiritual warfare, okay? All right, um, let's do, let, 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 let me give you another example. Another example is in the book of Exodus, and I won't take time to read this whole thing, okay? But when the enemy comes in, okay, the, the children of Israel were what? They were persecuted for 400 years. That word, let me give you the Greek definition of that word persecution very quickly, okay? It means to be chased, okay? It means to be pursued. It's a prolonged attack, okay? It means to press forward. Persecution always comes against you, always pushes you, always drives you, okay? Satan always drives you. It's not the word of God. that The word of God leads us. 
persecution drives us. And so we have the, the children of Israel sitting in, the, sitting in Egypt, being persecuted for 400 years, the Bible says. And finally, the day comes, the day comes that they're going to be released, that they're going to be set free. Okay? And what happens? God leads them out, leads them out of Egypt. He doesn't lead them out of Egypt all poor, disgusted, busted, and broke. Okay? The Bible says they basically, the, the children of, the, the people of Egypt paid them to leave. Okay? And the Bible says they left wealthy. The Bible says they left rich. The Bible says they left prosperous. And the Bible says there was no one feeble among them. They left healed and delivered. Okay? Ah, uh, but when they got to the when they, when they got to the Red Sea, when they got to the Red Sea, something happened. Okay? And the Bible says that the persecution continued to come. The persecution is trying to run them down. The persecution is chasing after them. The persecution is pushing them. Come on. All right? And so what happens? Okay? Moses stands up and he proclaims the word of the Lord. He responds properly to the persecution. When the persecution came, Moses does what? He says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For the Egyptians you see today, you shall see them again no more forever. And he delivers them and he sets them free. Moses responded properly. He used the word to defeat the... Why did the persecution come? The persecution came because of the word, because of the promise of them being in Egypt. Okay, the persecution came because the word continued to increase them. The word continued to bless them. The word continued to prosper them. The reason Pharaoh got so upset was because they were more, they were more of them than they were of the people of Egypt. Their flocks, their flocks increased. Their herds increased. And and Pharaoh became afraid. Pharaoh became concerned that they'll take over. My God, it was never in the mind of God to take over Egypt. He had a special place prepared for him already. Okay? And because they never left Egypt, the persecution comes and does what? Drives them out of Egypt. Okay, they could have made an alliance. They, 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 they could have made an agreement with Egypt at any time to leave. Okay, and when they did try to leave, the tentacles of Egypt just held on to them, but they could have left. But finally, the persecution comes and the persecution pushes them out. Do you see it? Okay, persecution always comes because of the words. So and when they got their backs against the Red Sea, and their fronts against the, against the Egyptian armies, what happens? Moses speaks the word. Moses responds with the word. And the Red Sea opens up and delivers them on dry ground. Not just an open sea, but delivers them on dry ground and then buries the enemy in the midst of the sea. Do you see it? Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. Persecution always comes because of the word but the word always delivers you from persecution. Now, let's go back to, back to the book of Acts chapter 8. I want you to see a couple of things and we're going to close here. Because I fully believe, I fully believe we're about to enter into a time where we're going to receive some opposition in 2021. We're going to receive some things in 2021 that we are not going to like. Persecution is going to come. Some of the freedoms that we've enjoyed over the past four years those freedoms are going to be threatened. Some of them are going to be taken away. Okay, we're going to be, and I fully believe before the end of this, of the, I fully believe we're already seeing it being censored on how to preach the gospel. Okay, there are some things that are not going to be, that, that the person, that's what the persecution does. The persecution comes because we want to do what God has called us to do. I don't want to go too far into that, but I want you to understand that when the opposition comes, when the threats come, when the pushback comes, that's not a time to cower in fear. That's not a time to give up. That's not a time to stop. That's a time to press forward. That's a time to go forth. That's a time to proclaim and preach this word even more. Okay? Watch the setup here. I want you to see the setup. 
okay? So how many of y'all want to be promoted in the things of God? I'm glad you said that because watch what happens. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we're almost finished. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there arose a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the ecclesia, entering into every house and hailing men and women connect and committed them to prison. Therefore, they were scattered abroad. They went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Okay, watch this. And Philip with one and, and, and the people with one accord gave heed to the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Watch this. Come on, let's go a little bit further. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many were taken with palsies that were lame and they were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Let me just stop right there. What did Philip do? Philip did exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 and in Mark chapter 16. He went forth, he proclaimed the word, he proclaimed the word, and God confirmed his word with signs and wonders following. Do you see it? Do you see it? We're wanting to see miracles. We're wanting to see people healed. We're wanting to see people set free. My friend, my brother, my sister, let me tell you, it's not going to happen until you go. It's not going to happen until you proclaim this word. Okay? It's not going to happen until you step out in faith and you begin to do some things. Oh, but what if I do it and it doesn't work? Well, what if you don't do it and it would have worked? Come on. All right? Okay? You've got to go forth. And I believe, and I prophesy this, God is setting us up that this year, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to go. You can't sit on the fence anymore. You can't compromise. There's an old, there's an old saying that I've heard many preachers say, and I've, seen, I've, I've, and I've seen it bear forth in my life. I've seen it bear forth in other people's lives. That which you choose to compromise for, that which you choose to compromise for, you will lose. If you compromise to keep, if you compromise this gospel to keep something, no matter how close or how dear it is to you, you're going to lose it. God will not tolerate compromise in the believer's life. It will be judged. And I believe we're going to see in 2021, we're going to see that judgment happen even more severely. Come on. And I believe we're going to see it happen swiftly. Okay? We're not in a place of compromise anymore. I believe God is closing this church age out. And we're in a place where we must be obedient. We must listen to what the word of God says. We must be obedient to his promptings. We must be obedient to his leading. We must be obedient, church, to what he's called us to do. Watch what happens. Two things happen when persecution comes. Number one, the growth comes. Okay? Actually, three things as I'm, thinking, as I'm sitting here praying about this. Growth comes. The church increased when persecution came. Okay? Number two, confirmation comes. Okay? Confirmation comes. God confirmed the word when the persecution came. Okay? Because the persecution pushed a believer out of Jerusalem. And they went forth. And they did what they were supposed to do. And God confirmed the word. So, growth comes when persecution comes. Confirmation comes when persecution comes. Number three, guess what else comes? Promotion comes when persecution comes, okay? Philip was a deacon. Philip was a deacon. But when the persecution came, he was pushed out of Jerusalem and he went forth and he began to preach. The next time you see Philip referred to in the book of Acts after, after, after Acts chapter 6, who is he? He is Philip 
the evangelist. You see, promotion comes. Persecution is our friend. You hear me say this all the time. Persecution is good for me because I know when, I, I know when persecution comes. I know I've been obedient to the word of God, okay? I know that growth is coming when persecution comes. I know that confirmation is coming when persecution comes. And I know that promotion is coming when persecution comes. Four things, okay? Instead of three, I see Meg taking notes. Instead of three, make it four, okay? All right? Confirmation, growth, persecution, and proof of my obedience. Amen? I know, I know I'm being obedient to the word when the persecution comes. Hallelujah. Amen. So you see, God's going to set up a scenario where you have to go. Okay? Let me tell you something. This gospel must be and it shall be preached throughout the world. And it's going to be done not by not just by television, not just by YouTube, not just by Facebook. It's going to be done by me and you daily, speaking to our friends, speaking to our co-workers, being a witness where we are in our Jerusalem, then in our Judea, then in our Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen. Do you see it? Persecution. It's a necessity. It's got to happen. And I believe God's moving us to a place where he's going to have us be obedient to this gospel. Amen. Praise the Lord. Has that been a blessing to you? Bring all three of these messages together. Okay. Pull all three of these together. And what do we see? We've got, we, we need to understand that we are equipped, that we are ready, that we are prepared. And we're prepared to go because we've got the gospel in us that needs to be released. And even if we and even if we don't want to do it, he's going to send the persecution to us that's going to push us out there, and we're going to do it. Amen. Ha! Ah, come on. We love y'all. Be blessed. Amen. I want you to know we're praying for you. Keep us in prayer. Amen. We're excited about what God is going to do in 2021. It is the year of the local ecclesia. Come on. All right, it's the year of the local church. This world is fixing to see some stuff it's never seen before. The boundaries are going to be moved in 2021, and we are going to have to be the city set on a hill. We're going to have to be the light of the world that He's called us to be. Amen. In fact, turn, in fact you know what? Real quickly, go back to Mark chapter four. I want you to see something. Maybe we've never made you've never made this connection before but I want you to make this connection. Mark the fourth chapter, okay? And I'm going to pick it up at verse 20. This is land yapping. ain't going to cost you nothing. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. And then he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither shall anything be, neither was anything kept secret that it should not come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. You see, you are called to be set on the hill. And the reason you're called is because the word has increased you. 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And don't just equate, equate that to riches and wealth and prosperity, okay? In actuality, financial prosperity is the lowest form of prosperity. This is prosperity of the word. This is prosperity of peace in your life. This is prosperity of joy in your life. This is prosperity of abundance in your life, amen? You know, my boss, my supervisor, where I currently work at, and he ain't never seen me cast a demon out of anybody. He's never seen me lay hands on the sick. He's never seen, he's never really heard me preach except what I share with him and what I've shared with other people, okay, in his presence. But you know what? He will sit there and tell you, 
And he's told us to other people in my presence, there's something different about Jason because this coronavirus can't touch him. He's got some type of divine intervention. Now, when you got the heathen proclaiming God's healing, God's healing anointing on you and God's protective power on you, that's something. Why? Because I live this, and I'm not patting myself on the back, guys. Come on, okay? But I live this word consistently. They don't see me getting all down in the dumps. They don't see me depressed. They don't see me arguing when I'm told to do something. I always respond, what do you need done? My last words to him every day when I leave, I tell him to have a good night. If you need something, don't hesitate to call me. Why? That means I'm ready. That means I'm being a servant to him. And I told him this once, okay, as I closed my Bible. I said, for the time that I'm, for, for, for the time that I'm working for you, I'm your servant. Okay, and I gave him scripture for that. I'm his servant. Okay, and, and let me just give you, I'm going to give you a real quick list. What's some of the demonstrations of the spirit of God in our lives? It's healing, it's deliverance, it's casting out devils, it's living our lives according to the word, it's speaking right, it's working hard, it's being ethical, it's not being fearful, and it's not acting like the world when things happen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let the word of God be richly in, dwell in you richly today and let it overflow out of you. Amen. We love you guys. Be blessed. Don't forget your tithes and offerings today. Have a great Christmas if we don't talk to you before then. And be a blessing to someone. Use this time to draw someone to the kingdom. Amen. We love y'all. Be blessed. Get ready for 2021. It's about to happen. Amen. We love y'all. Be blessed. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.